In 2018, I spent one day inside the Chernobyl exclusion zone. When I first started my trip in Europe, I had this idea that I wanted to see Chernobyl, but I had no idea if it was even possible to get there or if anyone was even allowed to go in at all. I'd only seen documentaries about it and I assumed you need some kind of special permission to enter. But while I was staying in a hostel in Vilnius, Lithuania, I met these two New Zealand girls who had just actually been there. They told me everything I needed to know, so now I want to share that with you. First, I just want to cover some myths and misconceptions surrounding Chernobyl. I think a lot of people have been fooled by different types of media, and I'll admit I was guilty of this too. Number one, Chernobyl isn't in Russia. It's an easy mistake to make, especially after watching the HBO series. The reality is Chernobyl's in Ukraine. However, at the time of the accident, Ukraine and Russia were sort of this one country known as the Soviet Union. So many of the people working at the plant, such as Anatoly Dyatlov, had actually come from Russia and would speak Russian. However, people living in the villages surrounding Chernobyl would have been more likely to have spoken Ukrainian. Number two, it's dangerous to visit. People assume that Chernobyl is this radioactive ghost town that's far too dangerous for anyone to visit. Well, it's true that most of the people in the city were evacuated after 30 hours and in the surrounding areas after nine days. But today there's still around 400 people that live inside the exclusion zone and up to 7,000 people still working at the plant. There is still a lot of radiation, but it's nowhere near as severe as you would think. In most areas, it's only slightly above normal background radiation. Number three is deformities. People often talk about mutated horses and bears or wolves that are roaming around in Chernobyl. The effects of radiation at the extreme end is acute radiation syndrome, or ARS, which generally kills you within a few weeks. Outside of that, it's mostly cancer. Much less common is mutation, which can be from the radiation affecting the DNA or possibly exposure to heavy metals in the air like cesium. In the years following the accident, there are a lot of cases of mutated animals and even mutated people but generally they don't live for long and they usually don't breed. So when you visit Chernobyl today, you'll see plenty of dogs and you might even see a horse, but as far as I could tell, they were all completely free of any mutations. Number four, Pripyat, not Chernobyl. The accident happened at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, but the large city that's closest to the plant is Pripyat. This is the city that you see in the HBO series. There is a city called Chernobyl, which is actually much smaller and further away, and it's where a lot of the plant's staff would work and live. The Chernobyl city sits within the 30 kilometer exclusion zone, whereas the power plant and Pripyat are inside the 10 kilometer zone. Number five units and doses. Ronkins, rads, greys, and sieverts. In the HBO series, they usually use ronkins. Today, generally, the dosimeters give you a reading in micro sieverts, which is what I'll use for the rest of the video just to keep it consistent. The average background radiation in a normal city is around 0.14 micro sieverts. While I was inside the zone, the average reading in the atmosphere was around 0.2 up to 1.75, and the average dose for the day per hour was less than one. A much more common place to absorb radiation is actually on an international flight where at cruising altitude you're exposed to cosmic radiation or radiation from the sun from anywhere between two to three microsieverts per hour. This is why people often say that it's actually safer to be inside Chernobyl than it is to fly there or to fly anywhere. In the series when they say the initial dosimeter is maxed out at 3.6 Röntgen, that equates to around 36 thousand microsieverts. They later state that it was probably more like 15,000 Röntgen, which is 150 million microsieverts. Alexander Lelachenko was the earliest recorded death due to radiation from the accident. He's said to have received a dose of 2,500 rads or 25 million microsieverts. He died after 11 days. In summary, the radiation levels in Chernobyl today are much lower than they were in 1986, and you're no more likely to get radiation sickness from traveling to Chernobyl than you are on an international flight. If you're from the US or the UK or any European country such as Germany, as of right now, you can stay in Ukraine visa-free for up to 90 days. For whatever reason, if you're from New Zealand or Australia like me, you need to apply for an online e-visa and you should receive the visa within nine days. This will allow you entry to Ukraine for up to 30 days. The easiest way to see Chernobyl is with a tour. There are two day tours where you can stay inside the zone, but I chose to just do a single day, which was great value at around $99 US, which includes transport to and from Kiev and lunch. And for an extra $10, I was able to rent a dosimeter for the day. 
To enter Chernobyl, you have to pass through two high security checkpoints. You have to upload your passport when you're booking the tour and it's really important you do this at least five days in advance. When you arrive at the checkpoint, if they don't have all your correct details, they won't let you in. You also need to make sure you have your passport with you and that you're wearing long sleeves, long pants and closed toe shoes. Otherwise, you'll be left sitting at the gate for eight hours until your bus comes back. So now you've got the visa and you've got the tour booked, you just need to get to the city Kiev. The easiest way is obviously to fly, but I thought it'd be more interesting to take a bus from Poland. It's not ideal, but it does make for some good stories. So now everything's booked and you're in Kiev, all that's left to do is wake up on the day of the tour, make sure you're dressed appropriately, have your passport with you and some extra food, and find the pickup point to meet your tour guide. Now I'm going to show you the kinds of things you see on the tour. And if you don't want to be spoiled and just want to experience it yourself, then just skip the rest of the video. I'm going to try and say the Ukrainian names as best I can and I apologize for butchering the pronunciations. I took this photo of the dosimeter just outside of Kiev to get a reference for normal background radiation. We first stop next to a small town named Dityatki, where you have your passport checked at the border of the 30 km zone. It's forbidden to take photos or videos here because it's a secure border and you will be faced with armed guards who are very serious about their job. Once inside, we headed to a small village named Zalicia. Here you can see abandoned houses which have slowly rotted away in the 33 years since the accident. With some still containing family possessions, newspapers and documents. It's difficult to say whether some of the items might have been left on purpose by tour guides or if they've genuinely been preserved in the time capsule that is the Chernobyl exclusion zone. Either way, they're very creepy but also fascinating. A quick check of the dosimeter shows the background radiation levels slightly above average. Now we're entering the actual city called Chernobyl, which as I said is much further from the power plant than the major city Pripyat, but it's here that the administration for the plant is based. There's not much really to see here other than some buildings and some statues, but one thing I wanted to point out in this image is the pipeline raised above the road. Since the top layer of soil is contaminated with radioactive particles, if you have any problems with underground plumbing or cables, it's not safe to dig them up, so new pipes and cables have to be laid above ground, meaning when they cross a road it needs to go over the road high enough for vehicles to pass underneath, and it's pretty common to see this throughout the zone. What looks like an average bus shelter here actually represents something much more. The signage here actually points towards a summer camp for children, where this would be the place to catch the bus to the camp. However, the signs always said that the camp was closed. I'm told that this bus stop was really a distraction to keep people from traveling down this road to a camp that would be closed, because what's actually down this road is something totally different. When you get to this entrance, you're greeted by some creepy decorations, and this friendly dog, who I'm told is named Tarzan. This is Duga Radar 1. It's one of three radar towers which were built to be used by the Soviet Union to triangulate and detect incoming missiles from the USA. Despite the fact that this is one of the largest man-made structures I've ever seen in my life, it was kept a secret to the nearby residents. And being deep in the woods, it's very hard to spot it, but it is possible to see from Pripyat if you know where to look. You can see on the decimeter that the background radiation has increased again a little more. This next stop on the tour is a small kind of orphanage or kindergarten in a place named Kopachi. Once again, the background radiation has increased, but it's not consistently increasing. There are some places which are more radioactive than others, and you can see here on the ground there's a hot spot where there's probably some piece of material in the soil which may have come from the explosion. If you thought the previous village was creepy, it gets much worse now.
This place is filled with old toys, dolls, and children's beds, still with clothes and blankets laying around as they were left since the evacuation. Here's a rail across to a section of the reactor site which was under construction at the time of the accident. You can see a half-built cooling tower on the left, and you can see a construction of the reactor building. In this image, you can see the building containing reactors 3 and 4, and the channel from the cooling pond which supplies water to the plant. Reactor 4 on the left is the one which exploded, which was initially encapsulated by a concrete tomb known as the sarcophagus. But more recently in 2017, it's been covered with this large silver arch-shaped structure known as the New Safe Confinement. Before approaching the plant, we stop at the employee's cafeteria for a nice Ukrainian worker's meal. It doesn't look very fancy, but it's not bad. It's perfectly safe to eat here and I actually enjoyed it. There are some more dogs outside hoping to catch some leftovers. They're all very friendly around people and some of them will even let you pat them. Now I'm standing at the observation deck, about 200 metres from ground zero. You're allowed to take photos from this angle, but really anything else is forbidden due to the security concerns. You can see that even standing right next to the reactor building, the background radiation on the decimeter still reads lower than what you're exposed to at the cruising altitude on an international flight. And now the star of the show, Pripyat. From this Pripyat sign you can see over to the Red Forest, which we didn't visit because it still has very high levels of radiation today due to the particles that rain down over the forest, giving the trees their orange tint. Like the abandoned houses in Zalicia, now we see entire apartment buildings completely empty. Some ransacked and some just left as they were in 1986. Our guide showed us reference images to compare just how much nature has consumed what was once a lively, modern, affluent city. Some buildings can only just be spotted among the plants and trees. This abandoned port was a place of leisure for the residents of Pripyat, who would take boat trips around the lake. You can see a partially submerged houseboat abandoned in the distance. This is the hospital, medical unit 126. This is where the firefighters and plant workers were brought immediately after the accident. Once they realised their clothing was contaminated with radiation, it was all removed and dumped into the basement, where it remains today. Somebody at some point brought this piece of cloth from a firefighter's helmet up to the entrance. You can see that even after 33 years, it's still reading over 72 microsieverts, which gives you an idea of just how bad the exposure was for the first responders. You can find videos of people going into the basement where readings from things like firefighters' boots can be over 1,000 microsieverts. They're usually wearing protective clothing but often neglect to wear gloves, and I would highly recommend you don't do that. This is the theatre, which is also something like a performing arts centre or a school. I'm not sure if the piano works, but it's advised not to touch anything. If you've seen the HBO series, you might recognise the Hotel Policia, which is where the protagonist, Valery Legasov, was staying while in Pripyat. The reference image shows a stark contrast between the glitzy Pripyat of the 80s and the post-apocalyptic, nature-thriving Chernobyl of now. Following the square leads you to the recreation centre, the Palace of Culture, Energetic. Inside there's all kinds of sporting facilities including a basketball court and even a boxing ring.
and from here you get the first glimpse of the amusement park. This is the home of the famous Ferris wheel, depicted in movies and video games. It seems creepy to think of all the fun and entertainment that happened here and to know that it was all ruined by this tragic accident. But from what I'm told, the amusement park was under construction and they hadn't actually opened to the public at the time of the accident. At this point, it felt as if we were walking out of the city and while on this small trail surrounded by 30 meter trees, our tour guide asked where we thought we were. We thought we were in a forest until the guide pointed at the grandstand in the distance and we realised we were standing in the middle of a football field in the Pripyat Stadium. Quite bizarre to see a grandstand facing a wall of trees, but it's a perfect illustration of just how much nature has thrived since the evacuation. The last stop in Pripyat is the swimming pool. You can see compared to the reference image, it's almost completely hidden. Inside there's another basketball court and a large swimming pool with a diving board at one end. The graffiti and trash in the pool gives you an idea of how the place has been looted and interfered with since the accident. Not everything is kept as it was. Many people visit on tours each day and some people break in without permission. Standing on top of a 6 metre diving board is scary, but when the pool is empty it's even worse. On the way out of the zone, back in the city of Chernobyl, we stop by the monument of those who saved the world. The monument depicts the first responders and the liquidators who were involved in cleaning up the aftermath of the accident. As you leave the exclusion zone and say goodbye to the dogs, it's a nice point to reflect on. It's true that the accident at Chernobyl could have been prevented with better safety procedures and perhaps less corruption in the design and operation of the plant, but it did happen. And most importantly, it could have ended far worse. The dedication and sacrifices made by the Russian and Ukrainian people are immeasurable. There are so many heroes in this story who sacrificed their lives for the good of their own country, as well as the continent of Europe and the rest of the world. If you've ever considered it, I highly recommend a trip to Chernobyl. It's one of the most fascinating things I've ever seen in my life, and it's something that's extremely significant in human history. We don't give it as much attention as it deserves. If you've got any questions, feel free to comment and I'll try and answer them. Otherwise, thanks for watching and safe travels.